Good Zangpu and hello to our viewers and listeners. Welcome back to Drukyul's Digital Salon episode 13. My name is Tinde Choden and I today I'm very happy to be in conversation with uh, Mr. John Werheim, who's actually not a stranger to Bhutan and no stranger to me as well. We have known each other since uh, 2002, two, maybe? Two or three. Two or yeah, three, yeah. 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 So we when go, you first came to the East West Center in Honolulu. Yes. Was that 2002? 2002. Yeah. So when yeah. I first uh, came to or went to Hawaii for yeah. the first time, I met John there. And uh, since then, we've been friends. And John has obviously come to Bhutan before I met him. But I'll let him tell that story. Um, but maybe we can first of all start about with John introducing yourself. Well, I was born in Chicago. Chicago, Illinois, and uh, then I went to university uh, at, uh, in Indiana, South Bend, Indiana, at the University of Notre Dame. And uh, at graduation, the first job that I got out of uh, university was working for the Sierra Club mm. in um, uh, San Francisco. And uh, one of their first assignments that they gave me was a three-part series called Paradise Lost. Mm -hmm. uh, it was an environmental expose. People had this um, image of Hawaii as being a, a paradise, and it is a great place. Um, you know, just like a, um, every other place, though, it's, it had environmental issues. Uh, what many people don't realize is that Hawaii's experience the highest rate of um, the uh, loss of uh, native species in the world. Hmm. Yeah, because of avian flu, uh, the invasion, uh, the uh, um, dissipation of mosquitoes through our forests, and uh, um, and a lot of the result of agriculture and development. So that was, you know, the beginning of my. And I've been in Hawaii pretty much ever since then. Though I left Hawaii for periods to work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and in 19, I started working with the Alaska Energy Authority uh, because uh, all throughout my life, university and then till now, I've been both an engineer, a writer, and a photographer. And mm -hmm. then when I started doing this Bhutan project, I became a filmmaker. The, the first film I did was uh, the Bhutan film. But uh, I first came to Bhutan in 1991, and uh, I was very anxious to come to Bhutan. Uh, I had met Bhutanese in Bodh Gaya in India at the Dalai Lama's first Kali Chakra. Kali Chakra. I think that was 1973. No, it was the full moon of 1974. And, uh, I had been working um, in McLeod Ganj, Dharamsala, mm -hmm. for the Dalai Lama's uh, uh, school. Well, it was the school for um, refugee kids. It was a, a drama school, dance and drama school. And I was also working for um, the uh, Tibetan Library of Works and Archives, mm -hmm. uh, writing photo photography and, and doing um, uh, microfilming of uh, rare and ancient texts. So when I so I, I knew Tibetan culture, I knew Tibetans. I began to learn some Tibetan because I was teaching Tibetans, kids, little kids. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I came to Bodh Gaya and met Bhutanese, at first I looked at them and thought, "Well, they look like Tibetans." But you know what? Wow, their clothes certainly Same are but colorful, <laughs> and the Tibetans are well. You can understand they had just lost their country. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I thought they're, you know, they're, they're wonderful people and, uh, you know, they share a lot of uh, uh, characteristics with the Bhutanese, but they had been beaten down mm. and still resilient, you know, wonderful people to be, but the Bhutanese were like, let's party. And they were, you know, and they were always in the, they had their own tents and the, I mean, the, the row of, of little shops and they had set up bars mm. and there were, Dancing and you I thought these people are interesting. <laughs> so you wanted to go and meet the cool yeah. kids. Yeah. Huh? So when I got an opportunity working for the Alaska Energy Authority, and they said, "Oh, you know, we we heard that uh, uh, Bhutan's got uh, is producing the lowest cost power mm. in the world." I don't know. They had researchers, and and they said we 
we'd like to look at some investment opportunities there. And so I was like, yeah, you know, I think I can probably uh, speak a little bit of the language and maybe at least the numbers, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, order something in the restaurant. And uh, what I really wanted to do is come here and write and photograph. Mm -hmm. I be, but I love hydropower engineering and development, but I definitely had an alter, uh, ulterior motive right. for coming to Bhutan. So what brought you to Bhutan actually was hydro to begin with, yes. right? Yeah. So you came here on a hydro uh, work for the government? Alaska Energy Authority. Alaska I, Energy Authority. Yes, and, and then, uh, so I was put to work on little troubleshooting things like redesigning intakes and you know, changing mm. uh, uh, filtration screens. And, right. uh, how, how, how did you manage to transition from hydro to what you love doing, which is photography, writing, and storytelling. I never transitioned. You, it was part of still, and I still um, own, uh, um, mm -hmm. you know, Pacific Hydro. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't do major construction projects anymore, but I still consult. Mm -hmm. uh, I love anything that'll take me out into a beautiful place, uh, you know, where I can uh, experience and work in nature. And that's both photography and filmmaking, and writing and mm -hmm. hydro. Mm -hmm. You know, because you always start at the intake, right? And right. Work your way down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, it's all kind of just an attraction I have. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have this book here in front of us called Bhutan: Hidden Lands of Happiness. Yeah. Um, tell us how how did you come about publishing this book, and what was the story behind collecting all these different um, snippets of stories you have in the book as well as the photographs. Yeah, yeah. so uh, I believe this was the first hardcover edition was published uh, what, like 2004 or 5 or 6 or mm -hmm. something like that. But when we first met, we met right at the East West, West Center. Center. I was having a major photo exhibit. Um, the uh, Wise powers that be to be at the East West Center um, just asked me if if I really knew the details about mm -hmm. what was in these photographs, and I had to tell them. You know, I don't, I'm not, I can't really add a lot of detail to um, the captions because I'm not Bhutanese, I don't speak Zonka. Um, we need an expert, and they went, "There's a Bhutanese." in the program right and that's how we met yeah you, I remember. you advised me you helped me with the yeah. you didn't help me with the caption i think you wrote them yeah i was i think that was my first trip to hawaii it was right after my undergraduate uh-huh and then i uh, was accepted at the east west center program yeah and i remember driving into the east west center and i remember seeing your your photo exhibition and the huge poster out there yeah, black yeah and they white. were announcing it was coming and they were getting, they were hanging it, mm -hmm. but they, I wasn't sure the captions and they weren't. Yeah. You know, I just admitted, yeah. I need, I need to yeah. talk to somebody. I need to talk to a, a Bhutanese person mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. just what's in these photographs. Mm -hmm. No, and that was actually when we first met as well. And some of the photographs you took. Right in and, front of the East West Center yeah. Gallery. You mm -hmm. were coming from your dormitory yes. and I was, yeah, and bingo. Oh, yeah. Hi, I'm John, and, and I'm I Tiddly, think, and that was You know, the for, me, for me, what stood out the most was uh, Bhutan. We are so used to seeing our photographs of what Bhutan in very vibrant colors. Yeah. You know, we and we our culture is very vibrant. We have yeah. a lot of colors in in our culture, in our arts, yeah. in everything. Uh, but your photograph was all black and white. That's right. So my initial impression was, why is it all black and white? It's so boring. <laughs> uh, but then, of course, you know, you talked talking to you and talking to people who are really into this artistic eye for photography. You actually come to appreciate a lot more out of the photograph. Because you actually have to do some work in, yes, in appreciating the Yes, it's like the, the difference beauty. between a reading a book and watching the movie. Right. You have to bring some of your own imagination to mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And it is an abstract art, mm -hmm. right? This is, no one's pretending that this is what it really looks like. Yeah, but yeah. You're, you, you do more than photography, right? You write stories. Like you said, you're yeah, a writer. Yeah, I write stories. I, I, I uh, mm -hmm. produce films. 
And yeah. maybe uh, could you tell us? But I'd like to go back to the black and white. Now, my main motivation, my main concern when I first started in photography, and this is before, well before the digital age, mm -hmm. all of my Bhutan work is yeah, done with right. film. Right. Okay. Yeah. Back in those days, uh, color prints, color slides, color negatives weren't permanent. Mm -hmm. I think everyone has had, you know, the, the great family picture on the wall and in 10 years it's blue. So black and white was the only way to archive and preserve. preserve. You, you, I think a lot of people are, uh, know about these old photos, especially some of the old photos of mm -hmm. Bhutan mm -hmm. taken over a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. And they're perfect. So that was probably, you know, when I'm selecting a subject, the first thing that I ask myself is, um, are people gonna be interested in this in a hundred years? Mm -hmm. And is it gonna be even more interesting in 200 years? Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm going to do that in color, right. they're not going to be seeing anything in 200 years. Right. But it's all changed now. Mm -hmm. The digital age, um, we can preserve color as long as we have good files, good servers. Look, it, it has to be constantly copied and mirrored back and forth. But the new book, the book that I'm working on now, will be in color. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's pretty exciting. I right. mean, like you say, Bhutan is yeah. colorful. Yeah, well, since you brought up the new project that you're working here, and yes. that's why you're here in Bhutan right now, maybe you can tell us what, what brings you back to Bhutan. Well, um, as, as you remember from the East West Center, uh, um, I had sponsored a lot of monks mm -hmm. at the East West Center. They yeah. lived with us in our house in Manoa. Yes. They visited our house on Kauai. They, yeah. We got to be good friends. And just around our kitchen table. You took them surfing. Right? You took them surfing as right. well. Right, right. surfing, <laughs> hiking, hiking the Kalawao. Hiking, yeah, cooking. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we had a great time. But they, um, this pro the project I'm doing now is... Uh, I'm working for the central monastic body. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just uh, like a, you know um, a hired contractor in a way. Uh, all of these other projects have been my projects. Now I'm not working on a project that's mine. I'm working um, on a project that the Drat Song mm -hmm. has conceived, and it was conceived around um, the kitchen table that you remember well. Right. And. Uh, and it is the working title is um, Living Masters of Bhutan. And mm -hmm. it is a, uh, it'll be a book and a film and a major archive of hundreds of hours of interviews with the um, greatest um, masters of the Drukpa uh, Kagyu school, school of the central monastic body. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, it, all of, it's, I'm basically just, you know, the monks are pointing me in a direction mm -hmm. and I, you know, you know, I'm not, we've got, monks are interviewing, we've got both monks and lay people working on the cruise, but that's a, I'm very excited about the project. You know, we've been talking about this for years mm -hmm. and it's finally, well, it's the 400th anniversary. Right. And that's when they decided, oh yeah, it's time to time do this. Time to do it. That's what it's no, all about. No, it's actually quite exciting and I think uh, it's also very timely, especially given just how the evolution of culture and also evolution of what uh, knowledge means and yeah. what preservation means. And I think uh, for our Bhutanese Buddhism, you know, which is not necessarily known outside the world so much, but this project is not for the world necessary, it's for a future generation as well. Especially, um, I think now more and more with the digital age, yeah. you know, I think having young people understand and know and have this knowledge preserved and be accessible. You know, yeah. I think it's, it's quite yeah. exciting. Uh, maybe you could also talk about is, you know, because one of the biggest challenge uh, for a project like this is the local talent or having local people yeah. do this project after you leave. The, the goal, uh, so the book in the film is really just the beginning of a project. Um, at the end of two years, what, what I'm hoping to have accomplished and what the Drat Song is asking is that the media office will be able to produce um, a magazine 
maybe quarterly, maybe eventually monthly, mm -hmm. that they'll upgrade all of their websites so that they're actually um, vehicles for teaching the Dharma, just like the magazine. Mm -hmm. And uh, a huge part of it is um, we're going to have these hundreds of hours of recordings of the masters. And these will be a wide diversity of masters. You know, meditation, um, uh, mantra, mm -hmm. uh, dance, painting, uh, even the wind walkers, you know, the great meditators who are capable of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like covering uh, 80 Distances. kilometers yeah. a day without barely eating mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. drinking. So you have some absolutely incredible people here, and it's a decision made by the Dratsang that where your tradition was always oral, or almost always oral, except for the ancient texts, uh, they want this stuff to be mm -hmm. everything transcribed. Right. And all of these transcriptions will eventually become textbooks for the Buddhist university. Right. That's, that's an amazing project and it's a big project. It's quite an exciting oh, project too. Yeah. I feel uh, a big responsibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe if we can go back to this book, uh, yeah. this Hidden Lands, because along with this book uh, was also a film. Yeah. A film, right? Uh, yeah, the, so uh, we did a, yeah, the book is Bhutan Hidden Lands of Happiness and the film was um, Taking the Middle, middle path, path to Happiness. To happiness. Yeah, yeah. 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 And in terms of what came first, what, what came first, the book or the film or how did it happen? Well, what came first were the photographs that mm -hmm. you helped me with at the East-West Center. So a, um, a producer, a guy that you got to know very well, Tom Vendetti, um, a PBS producer, saw the photos. And he said, uh, we've got to make a film mm -hmm. based on the stories that your captions told mm -hmm. at, the, at the exhibit. And so he got, he got in touch with me, and uh, he put together a film crew, um, and you were the in-country coordinator. You know all about what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. and, and my thinking was, if we're going to do all these interviews, and I've got you know, like 16 years of little notebooks with right. all these stories, that uh, I'm going to produce a book and a film pretty much simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they both, yeah. the, the uh, I think the book came out first, but not by much. They right. were, we were moving both Bo projects forward, just as we will be with the... Uh, with the uh, Living Masters. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, one thing that John does, which uh, he tells me is a good tip to have is that he, you mentioned this notebook that you carry around. I always carry it, but I took it out yeah. of my pocket because it, it was sticking out and yeah. I thought it wouldn't look good for yeah. the camera. But, but, yeah. but maybe, maybe you can tell us why you carry that notebook with you. Because you never know when some, often it's when somebody says something. Uh -huh. and I, like, but, or you get an idea. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. uh, and, you know, so I've been doing this long enough so I know kind of like, oh, that's going to work. Mm -hmm. somewhere right yeah. right <laughs> you know and then sometimes I'm just working on a problem so mm -hmm. I'm writing or doing a script or, or um, and um, I'm stuck mm -hmm. so what I'll often do is I just put a notebook in my pocket and I take a walk mm -hmm. and actually much of this book was written trekking right a lot of uh, the book, a lot of it, the, book the images is a trek. are all yeah. the mountains and, yeah, yeah, and, and yeah. Laya and Lunana. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Though yeah. there's some nightclub action in this yeah. too, right? <laughs> of course, there is. You wouldn't. You 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 would never want to miss a party wherever there wherever that is. Um, you know, apart from the Bhutan book, I know that you also uh, very recently your work on Taylor Camp um, mm -hmm. in Hawaii. Yeah. Maybe you can talk a little about that because that's been doing quite well recently as well. And these that, are also that very project, yeah. archival photos that you have taken. Yeah, same thing, black and white, yeah. Yeah, a film and a book, mm -hmm. very similar. You know, now for the third time, you know, we're going to be doing a film and a book. But that, that was about a, um, a treehouse community on Kauai that was... What is a treehouse community? Well, I mean, people living in, the, in tree houses, okay. up, up, I mean, in the trees, building houses in mm -hmm. trees. Mm -hmm. 
uh, kind of the ultimate uh, um, kid fantasy, you know, mm -hmm. living in the trees. So, uh, but there was a practical aspect of it because this was on a beach with some of the biggest and best surf in the world. Mm -hmm. This is a surfer's paradise place. But those waves got so big in the winter time, 30, 40, 50 feet, that they would wash over the reef, up the beach, <laughs> and under these houses. So they had to be up in the trees. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was a great community. Um, and so I documented it. Uh, and quite thoroughly, you know, almost every house, every person establishing shots, and um, had a great collection of photographs mm -hmm. uh, exhibited, just sort of like Bhutan, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, these were exhibited, mm -hmm. so these were, photographs were published and exhibited for actually uh, decades. Right. And then I just, I always had in the back of my mind that I'm gonna make a book, and about 35 years later, after I did the, all these original photographs, I just decided to go back and find all these people that I photographed mm -hmm. and interview what, them. What's the story behind Taylor Camp? Oh, it's a crazy story. So this is um, this little island in the middle of the Pacific, the Hawaiian island of Kauai, and this is the end of the plantation era. Mm -hmm. So it's just nothing, this place is nothing but sugar and pineapples, little plantation camps, very, very isolated. Uh, if you think of, of um, a Bhutanese village, up mm -hmm. in the, so these people were uh, very insular and very conservative. And as the plantation economy wound down because of competition from third world. Right. The prices were, um, a lot of surfers and hippies started coming to Kauai because best surf in the world, mm -hmm. uh, an island that had a population of 80,000 during the peak of the plantation area, has got less than 30, mm -hmm. the place is empty. Mm -hmm. And it's fertile. Fertile, well it's got abandoned um, plantation camps with gardens mm -hmm. and orchards and mm -hmm. fish on the reef and mm -hmm. so it was easy, cheap living, great surfing um, and the locals hated it, right? Uh -huh. Oh, they, you know, they, first of all, chill-ups, right? Uh, right? <laughs> <laughs> but there was that kind so of... So all, all the people who were at the Taylor camp, are, none of them are Hawaiian residents? No, that's what I was going to say. So that was the the prejudice, mm -hmm. that, because a lot of the politicians, they, they used, like, they were the other, right? right. The, these were, you know, we, they, called, they called chillips in Hawaii, haoles. So, so haoles are invading, you know, we've got to do something, elect me and I'll get rid of them for you. You know, it's mm -hmm. drugs and filth and immor immoral acts. Mm -hmm. But the fact is that a lot of the local people were terrified because their kids thought it was just really cool. <laughs> <laughs> and no, they were Hawaii. There were people from all over the world, including mm -hmm. people from Kauai and Hawaii mm -hmm. living in this camp. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, the mayor this is a crazy, this will tell you, this film is so ironic and so funny in the book. I'll give you one example of, you know, people in the theaters falling out of their seats, rolling with laughter. The original prosecuting attorney who saw these hippies and decided, okay, these are drug addled, horrible people. I'm going to arrest them, throw them in jail. I'm going to bust them for drugs and then I'm going to run, he already elected, and then I'm going to run for mayor. Or what mm -hmm. he, had. he eventually became mayor. So they raided the camp, and they couldn't, there were no drugs. Uh -huh. Because as one of the people we interviewed said, we were too poor to buy, buy drugs. drugs. How, we had nothing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so the, the, the prosecuting attorney, his name was Eduardo Malapit, who ironically, I'm a Notre Dame grad. Mm -hmm. He was a He's Notre, a Dame, Notre Dame, grad. Dame Yeah, okay. So the, there's a little mm -hmm. sub story going on here. So he prosecutes them for vagrancy, uh -huh. for not having a home and, and any money. Right. And the judge tells them, okay, uh, you're guilty. And. Uh, we're gonna give you three choices for your sentence. All of you 
go to the airport right from the courthouse and mm -hmm. get on the next plane and get out of here. Mm -hmm. Or get a, get a place to, uh, to stay in a job. And that was ridiculous because they, these people had been demonized in the newspapers. Mm -hmm. So no one was going to give them a job. At least, but they actually had a lot of local friends, but nobody would admit it. right? They, or the third choice, 90 days hard labor. These were men, women, and children. Mm -hmm. They never thought they would take it. So the leader of this group gets up in court, Your Honor, we're taking the 90 days. And they, they had... Um, no bedding in the jail. Mm -hmm. They had no cooks. They had nobody in the jail. The mm -hmm. jail was empty. So this was a terrible financial burden. <laughs> <laughs> to the states. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so it was horrible. You know, the worst. So here's the funny part. Eduardo Milan. Oh, the, the Taylor camper who gets up and says, Your Honor, mm -hmm. we'll take it. He nice. was a... Um, Notre Dame grad, oh, okay, so all the Notre Dame grads who, have some. Was at, who was getting his law degree at Berkeley uh -huh. when he, and he had a, his wife and his three-year-old, we'll take the 90 days. They, yeah, so he, Notre Dame, okay, yeah. crazy. <laughs> so there we were, you know, I'm not me, I wasn't involved with that, but. Uh, you um, were just a photographer. Yeah, but here's the funny part. Um, so we skip ahead a few years. Uh, Howard Taylor. So uh -huh. this is Elizabeth Taylor's little brother. Yeah, so brother. I was going to ask you yeah, why. This is Elizabeth name. Taylor, you know, the great movie star. So he's living on Kauai. He reads about this in the, in the newspaper uh -huh. and goes, 90 days for not having any money, men, women, and children, hard labor. So he goes to the judge and says, okay, one of the sentences was a job and a place to stay. Mm -hmm. I'll give him I'll a job and a place. And he moved him on to the most beautiful beachfront property and told him to clear it and build a little uh, community. Oh, so that's how Taylor came That's came how about. it started. Oh, Howard went and got him okay, out of jail okay. because one of the sentences, which was written about in the newspaper, right. somebody's got to give him a place to, a place stay, to in stay in a job. Okay, we jump ahead a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Guess who's living at Taylor Camp and one of like the, the, the Kung Fu Bill Malapet, the, the mayor's <laughs> little brother. Oh, really? <laughs> you could, He's there. I, you, I couldn't have written this. Right. If I wrote a script like this, people would just say, impossible. It's yeah. just preposterous. So anyway, yeah. that's, yeah. that's the Taylor no, Camp. No, I, I worked on that project of yours. I did a little of transcribing. And you, like you said, you, were, you went back to these same people right. who were in their 20s at the camp, and now most of them 35 years are, later, I tracked them. Most of them, them are like in their 50s, 60s, or yeah. 70s. Well, actually, it took me, I started at 35, I couldn't find them all. Mm -hmm. But we kept doing these test edits, and I'd, I'd produce a, 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 a film that wasn't really finished. It seemed like it was finished, but I knew there were things missing. Mm -hmm. And it took me almost another 10 years to just track everybody down whose stories I knew had to be right. told, and right. we did it. And I think it was like 2019. But anyway, that is the film in 132 print exhibition that's now touring Europe. Mm -hmm. It was sponsored by the American Embassy and the um, Prague City Gallery. Mm -hmm. It was huge. It is huge. Mm -hmm. It's just, yeah, I mean, the people in Europe are just, you know, hippies living in trees and surfers, uh, right. you know, just... It's right. hard for them to believe that some something like this is real. Yeah. No, I, I was just going to say that I was doing this transcribing work for you and some of these young hippies who yeah. lived on the camp and yeah. where they landed up, some of them are doctors and lawyers, aren't they? I of mean, course, just, these just were almost whole, all college-educated people. Whole turnaround uh, of, their, <laughs> yeah. of that uh, yeah. utopian community that they tried to... Um, yeah. Uh, maintain, yeah. which eventually uh, kind of broke down because it couldn't well, really the, survive. Well, the government finally, our hero, uh, our, my Notre Dame alumni friend, uh, he our won. hero, <laughs> uh, burned the camp down. Oh! They evicted them all. They got uh, court mm -hmm. orders, mm -hmm. and so that was the end of it. You know, the end mm -hmm. of a of a, uh, seven or eight year life of this uh, absolutely right. incredible place. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, oh, wait a second, one more. Mm -hmm. When my friend Eduardo, Notre Dame grad, um, began prosecuting these people and, and you know, trying to get rid of them, take them to court, 
they go to the legal aid office and they get Max Graham. Who's he? He was the head of legal aid. This is a attorneys um, that do pro bono, pro bono work, work for poor people. Mm -hmm. And these were poor people. I mean, mm -hmm. they came from middle class and upper class families. They were voluntarily poor, uh -huh. most of them. <laughs> voluntarily poor. No, that's a, right? Uh -huh. Okay. And uh -huh. then um, he's a Notre Dame grad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Max, mm -hmm. the attorney. <laughs> so all the Notre Dame and you're the oh you're a Notre Dame. So, so it, seems, at our 50th, it seems like Taylor Camp has this so, common so thing on Notre Dame. So this is a big Dame. deal. So we had this thing at our 50th Notre Dame reunion. Like, oh. Show that people were just going, oh my god. <laughs> uh, what happened to these good Catholic boys? <laughs> I know what happened, John. What happened to the good Catholic boys? I don't know. You know, I'm still a recovering Catholic. It's 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 hard. It is hard. It's hard. Huh? Life right? is hard. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, it seems like your life journey has been quite interesting from a good Catholic boy who went to I wasn't really that good. You weren't really no. that good. Well, at least you gave the impression <laughs> that you were good. Let's just say that. Um, you know, and even your experiences in India, uh, you know. Oh, you, yeah. You, I, I you, lived in, um, well, working for the Dalai Lama, you know, I was in in and out of India, Nepal, and the Tibetan border areas mm -hmm. for two years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how young are you now? I'm 75. Yeah. So, you know, in the 75 years of existence as a recovering Catholic. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I still have to go to a 12-step program every week. Yeah. Yeah. Are you it's attending a, your, are my, you attending my, your recovering meetings? recovering Catholic 12-step <laughs> program. Yeah, it's hard. Um, you know, that's why I was attracted to Buddhism. You know, it's kind of a, a way out. <laughs> right. Have you found a way out? Uh, I can't shake the guilt. You can't shake the guilt. <laughs> That's 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 a very difficult yeah, yeah, one no, to shake. No, on. actually, I have. You know. Yeah, <laughs> but it's a it's it's a good story, right? Yeah. Well, maybe you know, um, if we can kind of bring it back, um, maybe I'll 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 leave or end our conversation with two questions for yeah. you, especially for our young Bhutanese listeners on this uh, yeah. uh, digital salon. Um, you know, as a photographer uh, and a storyteller or mm -hmm. even a, a writer. And I think in this day and age, a lot of young people are attracted to this profession. Yeah. You know, what would you say uh, would be one or two or three things that these our young Bhutanese should work on? Because it may sound easy to say like, oh, I'm going to be a photographer, but it actually is a lot of work. So what would you oh, say? Oh, it's an enormous is, amount of work. Yeah, what would you and, say? And it is takes a tremendous things, amount of patience. Three things uh, for them to well, work on, build upon. Uh, a photographer has got to study photographs. Mm -hmm. So, uh, of course, you've got to be taking photographs. You, you've got to practice your um, skill. Skill, right? Yeah. So, but how do you even know how to begin? Mm -hmm. So uh, you have to look at photo books. You have to go to photo exhibits. Exhibition. You have to, and not just any photo books. So I, I used to teach photography at, at the university. And uh, so I, you know, slideshows, just the greatest photographers in the world. Every class, you're going to look at them. We're going to look at the books. Mm -hmm. um, where, uh, what did Picasso's great, um, what, oh, uh, Poor artists borrow, mm. great artists steal. steal. Yeah. You've got to look at the greats mm -hmm. and, and then try to copy them. Mm -hmm. You'll never mm -hmm. copy them and mm -hmm. then it, it will be your own. So mm -hmm. with photography, you've got to constantly look at photos. The photos that are most important for you to look at besides the masters are your own. I hang my photos. Mm -hmm on my walls. Yeah. I change them all the time. Mm -hmm. They're in my studio. Mm -hmm. They're in my house. Um, and then after a while, you look at that and you go, you know, that's not very good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you yeah. know? And then when you're photographing, you go, oh, I'm about to frame something just like that one that was on the wall that I took down and hated. Which is not or good, yeah. this one, I love it now. Mm -hmm. And I didn't used to like it that much, but You've got to just live with your art. art. And the same thing, okay, a writer, a writer, so a photographer's got to look at photos, a writer has got to read. Mm -hmm. Get rid of your TV. Right. Number one. 
Yeah, I know you're a great reader. I've gotten some. Well, really I'm also good a TV <laughs> anonymous, so I'm not only a Catholic 12 step <laughs> program, but yeah, I, when yeah. I was in the university, I watched T. I, I, I went crazy. I could not stop watching TV. My grades. Oh, really? I never I knew that, that about you. No, no, that's true. You know, I never, I've because never had a TV I, in my house. Ever since I've known you, you've ever no, no just TV like, at all. No. So no, and when even you if tell I go into a hotel a room, now, I'll like... put a, a towel over the television. Uh -huh. And that's ironic for somebody who had a, a, a contract for, with a public television service exactly. for ten years. Yeah. But. I'm telling you, this is a good advice. I, I got so angry with my TV, I think it was junior year in college, in the middle of winter in South Bend, and we had the screened-in porch in the back of the house. I ripped the TV, just, I didn't unplug it, I pulled it out, I went out into the porch, snowbank, threw it through a screen window, and just, it like, you know, in the spring, there, right. you, there yeah, there it was. And I, and I went, I'm never having this Thing in my house again. Yeah. And I'm because I can't control it. I'm a totally visual person. Mm -hmm. So some if a TV like if you know you go to a if I see a TV in a restaurant, I don't want to go there. Yeah. I can't stop looking, looking at it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you just stay away from it. I just no, I can't yeah. that's why I go to the twelve step program. Right. <laughs> good good Catholic boy. <laughs> um so you read a lot. I read, read a lot. every night. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know you're a great reader, and I've gotten some really good book recommendations yeah, from yeah. you as well. If you're going to be a writer, you first have to be a reader. Yeah. And have you ever taken any writing classes? or? Oh, or some of... I am still in touch with my uh, writing professor from Notre Dame. Oh, really? And Matt, well, he, yeah, I've been, you know, so we have, like, literary journals, mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. and plus, uh, mm -hmm. I mean... I had a poetry teacher and a writing teacher, and they both reviewed my books. And they, you know, they're just, yeah, they're doing me a lot of good. And they right. did me a lot of good as teachers. And I'm still in touch with these guys. They're, yeah, you know, they're my heroes. Mm -hmm. They made me. Mm -hmm. You know, they were tough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think um, we're about to the towards the end of our of our session here. Um, I'll give the last word to you. If there's anything you would like to say to end off our session today or our digital salon conversation. Uh, I, w I am uh, deeply honored to be doing this project with the Drop Song. Uh, I love Bhutan because I told you I'm a visual mm -hmm. person, plus there's so many cool stories here. Um, and I feel a tremendous responsibility uh, along with my thankfulness for this project because I, um, it's huge mm -hmm. and um, I just hope I can do it justice. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, John. Thank you. I think uh, Bhutan also sees you as a great ally um, and, and the number of years you've invested in Bhutan and the relationship you've built, I think that uh, everyone appreciates that and I think uh, people who know you are grateful yeah. for well, having Well, also, there's one other thing. Um, Available in fine bookstores <laughs> everywhere in Bhutan. Exactly. There you go. <laughs> the finest bookstores. The finest bookstores. <laughs> well, uh, thank you all very much for listening in. I hope uh, you've derived or you've enjoyed the conversation here. You obviously, John is a great storyteller, and I hope you've enjoyed all the stories he shared in this salon. Thank you. <laughs>